Good to be here and thank you, Caden, for your welcome. I hope you don't miss a single session. We have got some very, very exciting material to share with you just over this weekend. Um, so let's get stuck into it, shall we? <coughs> I want to take you down, first of all, in our opening session to one of the oldest civilizations on Earth, which is, of course, the land of, um, the land of Egypt. It's a land of massive pyramids and mighty pharaohs, a land where I literally saw divine predictions fulfilled, a land where kings were gods and gods were kings. Now, Egypt has been for over a century uh, an archaeologist's paradise, for after 4,000 years, its ruins and its mighty temples still stand, and they're always digging something up in Egypt to present to the world. Its giant monuments are so large they can be seen from over 50 kilometres away and they've nearly defied the corroding tooth of time. Now, Egypt is fascinating for many reasons. Firstly, Egypt is the oldest continually inhabited country in the world. It has the longest line of kings of any nation on earth. Egypt was even ancient when Christ was on the earth. Now, when you think of Egypt, what do you think of? First... The pyramids. And um, that may be so. By the way, anyone been to Egypt? Well, if you've been to Egypt, you, you, you know, you, you, uh, certainly the pyramids are impressive, but what you do bring back with you is a lasting memory of Cairo. <laughs> Every hour is peak hour in Cairo. And I tell you what, um, all kinds, you know, it has a population um, of nearly 23 million people in the greater Cairo region. It's packed out wherever you go. And all kinds of transport, both ancient and modern, jostle for position on its um, crowded streets. Even camels plod along there, next to the motor cars and so forth. And at night, you drift off to sleep to the sound of millions of people beeping their car horns all over the city. You might wake up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and it's still going on. Um, they just love sitting on the horn. Now, I've been to Cairo a few times, and from any high point in the city, you can look out and you can see the giant pyramids rising up out of the desert sands. And they've discovered some 77 pyramids in Egypt. And, of course, the largest of the Egyptian pyramids is the Pyramid of Khufu of the 4th Egyptian dynasty. It's located on the Giza Plateau, just on the uh, outskirts of Cairo, on the west bank of the Nile. And it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And by the way, it's the only one that's still standing of those seven wonders. Now, these three giant monoliths were built by the pharaohs Menkore, Khafre and Khufu, or their more common Greek names of Mykerinus, Kephren and Cheops. Now, a dynasty is where a throne remains in the family line and is passed down from you know, father to son, from generation to generation, until there's some war or something and a new family line takes over the throne. And they've discovered some 31 dynasties covering around 1,800 years of antiquity, but this is according to the revised Egyptian, Egyptian chronology of the late archaeologist David Down. And he's not the only one. There are a lot of Egyptian archaeologists who recognise Egyptian history is filled with chronological problems. And uh, the problem was, the problem is, they all know it needs to be revised, but no one can agree what just when and where to revise it, basically. But it's certainly Egyptian history is too long, um, and so on. Now, th these uh, great pyramids, they're simply built as tombs, aren't they? To, and they're the biggest gravestones you see anywhere on Earth. The Pyramid of Khufu is 4,000 years old and it has a base of some 13 acres. It's a massive th thing. And it's still one of the mightiest structures that has ever been raised by man. It dominates the landscape and it defies the imagination. In its original state, it rose up 160 metres above the desert sands and it remained the tallest building in the world for over 3,000 years. It was only in the year 1300 that the spires of the Lincoln Cathedral exceeded it in height. Now, the base forms a perfect square and its sides are exactly 230 metres in length and they're aligned 
Exactly, due north, south, east and west. And it's constructed so precisely that no measurement is out more than three quarters of an inch. It's estimated that the pyramid consists of some 2,300,000 blocks of stone, each averaging some two and a half tonnes. And the stone blocks are placed so accurately together, especially the ones in the inner tomb chamber, the granite blocks, you can't get either a hair or a needle between the blocks. They're just precisely placed together. Now, to give you an idea how much stone was used in these, to build these three pyramids, if hollow, the pyramid of Khufu here could swallow up the great mosque of Cairo, St Paul's Cathedral in London, the Colosseum in Rome, uh, St Peter's Cathedral in Rome, and the Notre Dame Cathedral that burnt down, that could go in there, and still have room to shake in a few other buildings. It's a massive thing. Now, here's a good question. How were these tremendous pyramids built way back then? Well, <laughs> in 2020, Elon Musk um, tweeted, aliens must have built them, obviously, he said. Now, I think he was tongue-in-cheek. A lot of people thought he was serious. Um, but Egyptian archaeologist uh, Zahi Huas called his statement a complete hallucination, he said. <laughs> well, some believe the dinosaurs helped them. Or there was some sort of levitation going on or, or all sorts of ideas have come forth about them, you see. But Zawi Hawass, who's the great uh, Egyptian archaeologist today, he said, inside the Great Pyramid there are inscriptions telling us about the workmen who built them. So they were built by people, none of these strange conspiracy ideas. No, they were built by men, but they were master craftsmen. Now the question is, of course, how many workmen were required to build these pyramids? And how long did it take? How did they transport the huge blocks of stone to the building site? Well, Herodotus was a Greek historian and he visited Egypt in the 5th century BC. And he asked the same sorts of questions and he stated that it took 100,000 men 20 years to build the Great Pyramid of uh, Khufu. And for many years, Egyptologists accepted the reasoning of Herodotus. They reason that since Pharaoh Cheops, or Khufu, reigned for about 22 years, it must have taken all that time at least to, um, to build it. So you have 100,000 workmen labouring for some 20 years using wooden sledges to move the blocks into position. However, in modern times, some significant discoveries have been made by Dr Mark Lehner. Another, uh, he's an American, but uh, a very uh, foremost Egyptian um, archaeologist with over 30 years' uh, experience. And he discovered about a kilometre from the pyramid some 4,000 workmen's huts they excavated. And he found several large bakeries that uh, were large enough to produce bread to feed at least 20,000 people a day. Now, there's no way you can house 100,000 people in 4,000 huts. So modern scholars now believe that Herodotus had exaggerated the workforce and that, in reality... It was only about 20,000 men working for 20 years to build it, and only during the annual flooding of the Nile, because then they couldn't do their, art, their agriculture and so on, so they'd work on the pyramid. Around four to 5,000 might have been employed full-time and uh, at the building site, and another 15,000 assisted part-time when they couldn't work the fields. Now, the workers used, we know now, that they use massive supply and construction ramps built around the building site to move the stones from ground level to their final position. And just building these ramps was a feat in itself. Now, while archaeologists have known that builders used wooden sledges to move the blocks um, across the sand, the problem that was debated for decades was the issue of how the builders overcame the friction in the sand. Now, you, you can imagine if you have a large, you know, couple of tonnes rock on a wooden sledge and you're moving it over loose sand, the sand's going to build up in front of the sledge and you won't be able to go anywhere. Um, so they were debating how they overcame this problem. Well, researchers at the University of Amsterdam solved the mystery about 10 years ago in 2014. They discovered that with the right amount of water um, poured in front of the sledge, thus stiffening the sand in front, that the force required to move the sledge across the sand dropped by as much as 50%. Now, here's um, a wall painting found in the tomb of this fellow. I'm not even going to 
try to pronounce his name, but it shows a guy and he's pouring water in front of the sleds. Now, they thought this was some sort of water offering being made or something, but no, it had a very practical reason to stiffen the sand to make it easier to move the heavy object across on the sledge. Now, listen, I've done some calculations to discover that um, if it took 20 years to build or to lay 2,300,000 blocks of stone, the workmen would have had to lay 315 blocks of stone per day or 26 blocks per hour per 12-hour days. And even using some of the most modern construction equipment we have today, it would almost be an impossible task. In other words, the pyramid builders were expert engineers that have challenged the intellect of modern man for centuries as to how they've built these impressive pyramids. But with a brilliance in engineering and construction known only to them, they still remain some of the greatest builders in human history. Now, you can see here um, on Khafre's pyramid, this is the middle pyramid of the three that's there, and it has some limestone casing still at the tip of the pyramid. And uh, this was a, a, a glistening white Tura limestone that was found nearby that covered all three pyramids. And I can tell you what, in its original glory, it must have looked absolutely fantastic to the eye out there in the, in the desert sun. Now, I went inside that pyramid, down a long, narrow passageway. You had to bend over for about 80 metres, and then there would be a spot where you could stand up, and then you'd have to bend over and crawl in some more. And, uh, you know, finally, we get to the tomb chamber, and guess what I saw? Nothing. <laughs> because all the pyramids, all the tomb robbers have come in and taken it all away and so forth um, there. Well, what about the lifestyle in ancient Egypt? How did people live 4,000 years ago? Well, everyday life in ancient Egypt was, in many respects, extremely modern. You know, they, the ancient Egyptians, they, um, they were wild about artificial wigs. They loved to wear wigs uh, for both men and women. And here's an Egyptian lady, and she's wearing a... Um, um, with her mummified face, she's got it painted with uh, her lips with gold and she's wearing a wig and her hair was waved and dyed. I've seen some of the mummies, you know, the lady mummies in there and even the dye was still in the hair and she had her hair permanently waved and the wave was still in her hair and after 3,000 or 4,000, that's a pretty rough, a permanent wave, isn't it? <laughs> it lasts that long. Pretty good hairdresser. The Egyptian women were just like some women today, by the way. They loved to wear um, not only the wigs, but they loved to wear body-hugging clothing to show off their curves. They had stone vaporizers and atomizers. They had perfume and so on. They had little nail scissors and tweezers for plucking their hair. They plucked their eyebrows. They blackened them. They painted their lips. They put rouge on their cheeks and painted their fingers and their toenails red. And they loved to wear jewellery. Now, I visited the Pharaonic village in Cairo. It's a place that shows what life was like on the Nile back in the ancient Egyptian times. And this girl was there, and I was trying to get her to smile for me. I don't know how many photos I took of her, and this is the expression I got. I thought, bother this, I'm going to come up with something. So at last I told her, you know what, you look as beautiful as Nefertiti, and that made her smile. <laughs> and well, it might, because uh, Nefertiti, the wife of Pharaoh Ignatan, was a very attractive uh, woman, if this bust of her uh, that's in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin is at all um, accurate. Um, Nefertiti no, liked, no doubt liked sitting in front of the mirror a long time with her cosmetic box, and nothing has changed, by the way, men, in 4,000 years when it comes to our ladies in the bathroom. Um, in one tomb, they found 15 different shades of lipstick for the ladies to use in the afterworld. And we think we're modern with all these things. I think they're just coming back into fashion. They had folding chairs and they excelled in the arts and the crafts. Their textile industry was second to none. And even the Bible speaks of the fine linen of Egypt. They pulled a cloth out of Tutankhamun's tomb that is made of some of the finest linen known. Common fabric in Egypt for the peasants was about 37 or 50 threads per inch. The cloth from Tutankhamun's tomb was over 200 threads to the inch. But an Egyptian cotton today is still considered 
some of the finest linen in the world even today. But the Egyptian weavers, they could make fabric at over 500 threads per inch. How they did that with all our modern, without all our modern technology, I don't know. They even had surgeons who could perform some sort of rudimentary brain operations. And the Edwin Smith papyrus, dating back 1600 BC, mentioned several neurosurgical procedures. Now, I visited here this temple of Kom Ombo, that's from the second century BC, and there on the wall, you have, they've carved there their surgical instruments, you see. And um, here's a birthing stool showing how the mothers gave birth to their children. Um, they had engineers, they harnessed the Nile for agriculture and Egypt was, of course was known as the granary of the world. They made multigrain bread, they had beehives, they could wake up for morning and have honey on their toast. Very modern. You know, in ancient Egypt they even had umbrellas exactly like we use today, folding umbrellas. Not to keep the rain off, of course, for them, it was to keep the sun off. And that's the reason why you could go to Egypt, you could throw your boots down in the soil, come back 500 years and put them back on again. Because whatever goes down in the Egyptian sand is just preserved forever. Um, they invented a system of writing and numerics and hieroglyphics and they wrote all over their tombs. And that's another reason why uh, Egyptologists know so much about ancient Egypt is because they wrote so much on papyrus and on stone and everything. In fact, we know more about what happened in ancient Egypt, say, 3,000 years ago, than we know what happened in Britain, say, 500 years ago. Yet for centuries, travellers and um, treasure hunters and researchers, they went down into Egypt, but none of them could read, read the mysterious writing on the walls and the tombs. That is, of course, until the discovery of the famous Rosetta Stone, which was one of the great archaeological discoveries of all time. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte had invaded Egypt. And from a military point of view, his invasion of Egypt was a bit of a failure. But he took with him 120 French scholars and artists to record what they saw down there. And at a small village called Rosetta, where they had a military base, on the western delta of the Nile, his soldiers came across a stone in the wall that was a bit unique. It was a black stone. Um, and when they took it out, they noticed it had inscriptions on it. It was, in fact, it was trilingual. And uh, here it is in the British Museum when I first saw it. It was made of black basalt, just about three foot ten inches um, in height and about just over two foot inches in width and about 11 inches thick. And um, today they got this behind a glass case. It's one of the, the major items that they showcase in the British Museum, the famous Rosetta Stone. Now, it wrote in three different scripts the same story. There's the Egyptian hieroglyphs at the top and then a, an, another Egyptian kind of way of writing called Demotic in the middle section and then there was ancient Greek in the bottom. Well, everyone knew how to read Greek. So by reading the Greek and comparing it with what was above, they were able finally to decode the hieroglyphs. It was the French scholar Champollion who worked on it for 20 years and in 1822, he emerged and he said, hey, I can read this strange hieroglyphic writing. And so now, with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, it, it really began um, Egyptology. And today, Egyptologists can read the hieroglyphs as, as easily as um, you and I can read our morning paper. Now, when I first visited Egypt back in 1995, I asked my guide to show me where the ancient city of Memphis was. And he kindly showed me on the map and he said we'd go out and have a look at it that day. Now Memphis, of course, was once the proud capital of ancient Egypt. It's 20 kilometres south of Cairo on the Nile River. It was the capital of Egypt in the days of the biblical patriarchs, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph and Moses. And it's where Egyptian history began. Memphis was founded by... The, Egypt, the first ruler, uh, Menes, the first king of the first dynasty of Egypt, who united Upper and Lower Egypt. And it was the greatest city in the world of its time, and it continued to be the capital of Egypt for over 500 years. It was known as the great temple city of Egypt. And I was very much looking forward to going to, going to see this great ancient capital and the ruins of Memphis, because 
When you go to Egypt, you go down to Luxor and Karnak, um, the capital of Egypt during the 18th dynasty, when Tutankhamun was around, and you have some of the greatest ancient temple ruins in the world. So I expected at Memphis, the capital of Egypt during the powerful early dynasties, that I would see more of the same. Well, my guide took me out here and he said, Mark, take your pictures, this is old Memphis. I said, you're joking. Uh, but he wasn't smiling because Memphis is gone and there's hardly a trace anywhere. So one has to ask the question, of course, where have all the ruins and the temples of the God Kings gone? Well, they took us into this little enclosure, a tourist attraction, and they said, this is all that remains of the once proud capital. Precious, precious little to look at, few broken down old statues and so forth. And here's a colleague of mine, He's wondering where Memphis got up and went to. Well, they dragged in a statue of Queen Hatshepsut um, from the 18th dynasty that was found 120 kilometres away and they put it in here to give us something to look, tourists something to look at because all the statues of the gods and the god kings have gone. They just don't exist around there at Memphis now. In a nearby building in this enclosure, you can see a colossal statue of Ramesses II of the 19th dynasty, the greatest pharaoh that ever lived. And that's not surprising, by the way, because Ramesses erected statues of himself all over the country. When you visit Egypt, you'll, from the top to the bottom, there's statues of Ramesses, this of Ramesses, Temple of Ramesses, everywhere. In fact, he erected over 500 of these statues and he's known as history's most egotistical ruler. He was up himself, in other words, sorry. Um, now, do you know, by the way, that Ramesses the Great had 92 sons and 106 daughters, and if that doesn't make a man great, I have no idea what does. Not all to the same wife, of course. <laughs> um, now, look, um, this is his lovely wife, Nefertari, at the Temple of Abu Simbel, but you can see her relative size next to the feet of Ramesses. Probably he's trying to portray her relative importance, according, you know, compared to him. But Ramesses wouldn't have felt so great if he knew what happened to his mummified body in relative uh, recent history. You see, they wanted to ship the mummy of Ramesses um, off to London for some examinations to help them, that might help them reveal how to better, you know, keep his mummy in, in good, good state and preserve his body for the future. So, um, they took his mummy down to the docks to ship him off to Cairo. Well, the clerk, the clerk down at the Cairo docks had never shipped a mummy before. And he, he had no category, you know, as the clerk down there, no category to record the shipment of a mummy. So the closest category he could find was dried fish. So the greatest pharaoh that ever lived was packed off and shipped off to London as dried fish. <laughs> but friends, the great Egyptian capital of Memphis today is gone. Its images of stone are gone and the place is hardly worth a visit. In the 7th century AD, when the Arabs conquered Egypt, they took the stone from old Memphis in order to build Cairo. Whatever else was left of old Memphis is buried under tons of Nile silt and the current village nearby. Not much has been excavated. They are doing, trying to excavate around, but not much has been found. Very little of its original, original palace, palaces or temples have ever been found. And I couldn't help marvel at what I was seeing because it reminded me of what, of what one of the old Hebrew prophets had to say about Memphis during the height of its power. Listen to what the prophet said. I will also destroy the idols and I will cause the images to cease from Memphis, said Ezekiel in the 6th century BC. And when that prediction was written, Memphis was still the capital of Lower Egypt. However, the prediction was literally fulfilled to the very letter. As Amelia Edwards, uh, Egyptologist, wrote in her book, um, A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, she said, and this is all that remains of Memphis, elders of cities, a few rubbish heaps, a dozen or so broken statues in a name. Where are the stately ruins that even in the Middle Ages extended over a space estimated at half a day's journey in every direction? One can hardly believe that a great city ever flourished on this spot or can hardly understand how it should have been effaced so utterly, but effaced it was. 
Now, the story of the pyramids really begins here at Memphis, and it's not hard to find the burial or the ne ne necropolis or the burial complex of a city, because all you do is find the city and then head west, because they always buried their dead towards the west, towards the setting sun. And west of Memphis is Saqqara, and the first pyramid structure uh, ever built in Egypt. It's called the Step Pyramid of King Zosa, who was the first king of the Third Dynasty. And Zosa was fortunate to, enough to have a, um, a genius for his vizier, uh, a man by the name of Imhotep, Tit, a master engineer, a remarkable architect. And he designed and he built this step pyramid that rises up in six stages. Prior to this, they would build, they would bury um, uh, kings and so forth in what they call mastabas, which is just a mud brick kind of... Um, um, little building over the top of the burial shaft. There's some here at Saqqara. So what Imhotet did is build a great big stone mastaba and then built another one on top and another one on top, you know, going up six stages. Then he covered it all with this beautiful white Tura limestone. And it wasn't until the beginning of the fourth dynasty that the first true pyramid was developed. And the first king of the fourth dynasty was a fellow called Sneferu, who seems to have built not just one pyramid, but three. So why did Sneferu build three pyramids? I mean, after all, even a god king can only be buried in one place at a time. Well, it seems he, the first pyramid he built was this one here at Maidum. It's about 64 kilometres south of Cairo. And what we see here is not the pyramid, but the inner core of the pyramid. And what the builders did was to build a seven-tiered stone core inside the pyramid... And then they filled in the steps with limestone casing to make it a smooth four-sided pyramid. And archaeologists believe that the outside casing collapsed near completion of the pyramid because it was evident that no one was ever buried in this pyramid. So Sneferu was not going to be buried in a collapsed pyramid, so he built another one. And this is called the Bent Pyramid, obviously. Um, it starts out at 54 degrees and then it decreases to 43 degrees about halfway up. And um, there's some cracks, cracks in this structure due to, no doubt, the enormous weight of the stone. And perhaps this is why he said, well, I'm not going to be buried in a cracked, bent pyramid. So make another one. So, um, well, they did. And third time lucky, they kind of got it right. And so he was happy to be buried there. And this is Egypt's third largest pyramid and the first true pyramid in Egypt. You can climb down inside the shaft, 61 metres down, which is only three foot high, into the elaborate tomb chamber inside. So, after three attempts, he finally got it right. But with Sneferu's son, Khufu, or Cheops, came almost a quantum leap in pyramid building. As I mentioned earlier, the base is, about a, is a perfect square, Today it's 146 metres high and orientated to the, f the four points of the compass. Now what I find interesting about all this is a statement made by the Jewish historian Josephus of the first century AD. And he said that when the biblical patriarch Abraham went down into Egypt, he communicated to the Egyptians advanced knowledge in astronomy and the mathematical sciences. This is what he said. He communicated to them arithmetic and delivered to them the science of astronomy. For before Abraham came into Egypt, they were unacquainted with those parts of learning. For that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt and from there to the Greeks also. And that may well be the case because um, it was in Mesopotamia that mathemat mathematics and geometry and astronomy were first developed. And they had built over there even... Um, they weren't um, tombs, but this was like a worship temple, the, the ziggurats over there that went up in various stages and so on. Now, the most spectacular discovery, I guess, of Egypt of all time was the um, discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. And the wealth of that tomb just literally staggered the world when Howard Carter brought it out to view. So I travelled from Luxor across the Nile River over to the scorching valley of the Kings, and a more inhospitable place you wouldn't find anywhere on, on, on earth because for most of the year the temperature is unbearably hot. And it was down here they made this startling discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. 
And you'll remember it was Howard Carter. He was being financed by the English Lord Carnarvon, who had a number of digs there, but still they knew this tomb was there in the Valley of Kings, but they couldn't find it. And um, Howard Carter, or uh, well, Lord Carnarvon, was about to give up on the financing of the search for Tutankhamun's tomb. And Howard Carter said, look, just give me one more go. Well, that's uh, when it was discovered. Well, we're here outside the tomb of Tutankhamun. Howard Carter tried to discover this tomb, had several seasons. He knew it was here. Of course, all the other kings of the 18th dynasty, their tombs were discovered. After several seasons, finally, Lord Carnarvon, who financed the dig, agreed to excavate for one more season. So Howard Carter, coming back for the last and final season, came and he noticed some rubble outside the tomb of Ramesses VI. So as they cleared away the rubble, they came across a stairway, and as they excavated, they came down to a door. Well, they, they came into the tomb and down a long passageway, and finally to the tomb chamber door. Howard Carter chipped a small hole into the tomb chamber door, and with the light of the candle, he peered in. Lord Carnarvon was with him, and after what seemed like an eternity, Lord Carnarvon could not hold himself back any longer. He asked Howard, what do you see? What do you see? And what Howard said was the understatement of a century, because he said many wonderful things. As their eyes accustomed to the darkness, what they seemed to see was everything seemed to be of gold. Gold covered boxes, gold couches, even a gold throne chair. The most, most amazing discovery of buried treasure that modern man has ever found. As I mentioned, the first room they encountered here was filled to overflowing with furniture and objects of every kind. There standing beside the burial chamber door were two black and gold life-size statues of the king. And beneath one of the couches they found the throne chair entirely overlaid with gold. And on the back of the chair you can see there Mr Tutankhamun and Mrs Tutankhamun giving her husband some good wifely attention. <laughs> By the way, Tutankhamun was only a boy king and uh, he came to the throne of about the age of nine and he died about the age of 19 and he was not a very significant king at all. Yet the wealth of his tomb staggered the world. Imagine, I can only imagine the wealth that would have been buried with uh, the tomb of Ramesses the Great, the greatest pharaoh that ever lived. Now in 2005, scientists associated with the National Geographic Society tried to work out what Tutankhamun might have looked like uh, based on his mummified skull. And this is what they came up with. Handsome fellow, isn't he? Then, after 2,000 CT scans of his mummified body, a new look Tutankhamun came to light. Not exactly the same handsome fellow he was made out to be before. Um, the BBC aired a documentary series called Tutankhamun, The Truth Uncovered where they maintained that based on the CT scans, Tutankhamun was not such a pretty boy after all. In fact, it reveals that Tutankhamun had quite an overbite in his jaw. He also had a club foot and wide hips. And the so-called virtual autopsy reveals that he had cholera disease or a disease of the bones. Now, he had more than a hundred walking sticks that were found in his tomb that he probably used to get around. Recent DNA analysis has revealed that his parents were siblings. Evidently, King Tut was the product of incest and had plenty of health problems due to genetic disorders. And he also suffered from malaria. Now, on February 18, 1922, Howard Carter entered the third chamber and he bored another hole in and he peered in. And he realised that what he had seen so far was a mere nothing to what he was looking at now. For the whole chamber seemed to be filled with one gigantic uh, shrine all overlaid with gold and it filled the entire room. And then as they um, were able to remove it, it found that there was... Four shrines, each fitting perfectly inside the other, and all overlaid with gold. And within the fourth was this beautiful stone sarcophagus, which is still in his tomb today. And within this stone sarcophagus, there were three coffins fitting each inside the other. You know, I hear a lot about the 
cost of living going up, um, bothers people and uh, well, me too. And almost every day you go somewhere and something's gone up. Well, let me tell you something else that's going up and that's the cost of dying. If you get buried in a wooden coffin, it's going to cost you a bit of money. If you get buried in a steel coffin, I tell you, it's going to cost you a whole lot more. But imagine being buried in a bronze coffin. Bless your heart, you get such a fright at the price, you'd sit up. But you imagine being buried in a gold coffin and shaped in the very image of the king. And while um, beautifully carved on top, inlaid with coloured glass and precious stones, and while each coffin was overlaid with gold, the third, in which was the mummy, was made of solid gold, weighing over 110 kilos. An elaborate um, uh, item of fantastic wealth. Now, this is Howard Carter. He's examining the inner gold coffin. And just removing the lid was a job in itself. But when they removed it, they were looking at a man that hadn't been looked upon for over 2,700 years. And over his head was this beautiful uh, death mask made of solid beaten gold, a priceless treasure of elaborate beauty and craftsmanship. Now, in the crowded Cairo Museum, there were, well, there are about 1,700 objects on display out of about 5,000 objects that Howard Carter took out of the tomb. Now, of course, all this today is being transferred to the Grand Egyptian Museum on the west bank of the Nile. And this is going to be, when it opens, um, it's nearly ready. I've got it on my bucket, the bucket list as soon as it opens. Sell the fridge, sell the car and go over and have a look. Um, but it, it will be the biggest uh, museum in the world when it opens. It's uh, been going on being built for about 20 years. And uh, there it is, just, on, just near, near where the pyramids are, inside, uh, plenty of space. And they will have all, uh, it will have 90,000 square metres of floor space and it will show 100,000 Egyptian artefacts. And importantly, all of the 5,000 artefacts that were taken out of Tutankhamun's tomb will be shown for the first time. Now, in Tutankhamun's tomb, every provision was made for the afterlife of the king. There was feathered fans to cool him, models of servants to serve him, all around he had the gods, Anubis, the jackal god of burial, and the cow god Hathor. Then there was this gold-covered canopic shrine which held the king's bodily, mummified bodily organs. And uh, it was protected round about by the scorpion goddess Selket, who is believed to help the revive the dead and introduce the deceased into the afterlife. Now inside was an alabaster shrine and inside that, there were four golden sarcophagi. And when they you know, preserved the men, they would take out the internal organs and mummify them and put them inside these golden little uh, canopic jars and preserve them. Now, this was the greatest discovery of buried treasure ever found by men. Howard Carter had discovered a vast quantity of golden treasure and for Tutankhamun they even put golden caps, he had uh, golden um, thongs and golden caps on his feet and his toes. Now after seeing with my own eyes and going to the museums there, the staggering wealth of ancient Egypt, I can appreciate the tremendous conviction that Moses must have, must have had to turn his back on all the wealth and fame of that mighty empire. It says here in the biblical record that by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was about to step up as the next Pharaoh. But he refused that, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin. Now, let me show you something else about Egypt, and I find this quite fascinating and quite incredible, actually, that if I had not seen it for myself, I'd hardly have believed it to be true. When you visit the Cairo Museum, you see right outside, in the, um, the square outside, a pond. And in that pond, they've got some, what do you think is growing in there? Papyrus is growing in the pond, that's right. Now, I asked my guide, why have they got this growing here, right outside the, the Cairo Museum, containing all the wealth and the artefacts of ancient Egypt? Well, he explained, well, this is how ancient Egypt got its wealth. 
because when you go down to the museums, you're just taken aback by the amount of gold that you see. And he explained to me that the ancient Egyptians were the first people in the world to make paper. And they traded in paper all over the Mediterranean world. Now, prior to that, they used clay, like you see up here, these uh, tablets with this wedge-shaped cuneiform writing, and they use it for trade, but it was quite cumbersome. Now, papyrus was like, you know, the discovery of the internet is to us. Um, so they made a lot of paper and they sold it around the ancient world. And the museum has placed it right out in front to let every tourist to the Cairo Museum or the visitors of Egypt to see where the ancient wealth came from, from their trade in paper. They skinned the reeds, they soaked them, they laid them out flat, they pressed them together, and I tell you what, it's the best paper the world has ever seen. It still exists after 4,000 years. They've pulled them out of tombs and so forth. Um, now, the interesting thing is that there were millions of these papyrus reeds growing in the River Nile and around the waterways, and of course, they cultivated it as well. <clears throat> but you can travel the Nile today from top to bottom in Egypt today, and you won't find a single blade of papyrus growing naturally anywhere in Egypt. It's become extinct. Now, this is Dr. Rajab's Pharaonic village in Cairo. It shows, again, tourists, tourists what life was like on the River Nile in the ancient times. And it shows that right out front, they've got this papyrus boat showing that they made boats made out of papyrus. I mean, they couldn't go down and chop down any trees. There was hardly any wood in Egypt. And... Um, and then they had, outside the Phronic village, a, a model of four Hyer Dahls papyrus boat Ra 1. I don't know if anyone remember, remembers Thor Heyerdahl and his papyrus boat trying to crossing over the Atlantic. So he wanted to... His contention was that the ancient Americas, and there's far more pyramids in South America than there is in Egypt, his, his thesis was that the ancient Americas got their culture from ancient Egypt. So to prove it, he was going to build a papyrus boat and sail it across the Atlantic to South America to prove that the Egyptians could have done this and this is how the culture transferred to South America. Well, <clears throat> he built, while he built the boat, boat in Egypt, he had to get 500 bales of uh, papyrus shipped in from Ethiopia um, further up the Nile because papyrus was extinct in Egypt. And it reminded me of a statement that one of the Hebrew prophets made in the heyday of Egyptian power back in the 8th century before Christ. <laughs> the papyrus reeds by the river and by the mouth of the river and everything sown by the river shall wither and be driven away and be no more, it says. And that is literally true today. And, you know, when the prophet said that in his day, it would seem as stupid and ridiculous if I were to say that all the rice is going to die out and be no more in Asia, or all the wheat is going to die out and be no more in Australia or something like that. Um, now, Isaiah 19, it contains both a predicted judgment and a blessing also upon Egypt. And while some translations don't use the term papyrus reeds, what is sure is that there is a predicted judgment against what was grown by the Nile and the source of Egypt's wealth. And it was the papyrus reed that was the greatest economic resource that ancient Egypt had, and it's simply no more. They traded their paper for gold and other commodities all around the ancient world. Notice the Washington Post. When papyrus ruled, talking about the greatness of papyrus and so on, uh, it says, exports of Egyptian-made papyrus paper beginning about 3000 BC, raised money needed to maintain the armies on the Nile. In later millennia, papyrus exports from government-controlled marshes would become the chief source of income for Egyptian monarchs. Well, notice what Thor Heyerdahl had to say concerning the papyrus reed in his book, The Ra Expeditions. This is what he said. Pharaoh lies in his tomb with reed boats painted on the stone walls, stone and reeds. Stone in the desert and reeds on the shores of the Nile. Stone and papyrus reeds were nature's gift to the peoples of the Nile. Stone was transported on papyrus and papyrus boat was immortalised in stone. The papyrus flower appears again and again in the art of ancient Egypt. It was the national symbol of Upper Egypt, but that was long ago. 
No papyrus, he said, grows in Egypt now. There's plenty of stone if you want to build a pyramid, but not enough papyrus to build a toy dinghy. Papyrus had died out in Egypt, no one knew why. The gods had taken back one of the oldest gifts as if they had simply pulled it up by the roots. Ladies and gentlemen, you can travel, as I said, from one end of the Nile to the other in Egypt today, and the papyrus reed, which was so prolific in ancient Egypt, uh, is extinct today. It's no more exactly as the prophet said it would be. Yet further up the Nile, for example, in Uganda, papyrus reeds grow naturally in great abundance around the Nile waterways. Now, in the small waterways of the Phronic village, in Cairo, you can see a lot of papyrus growing there to show tourists what life was like all over the Nile. So I asked my guide, does the papyrus um, reed grow naturally here? He said, no, they plant it and it lives for about two years and they, you know, dies and they have to continually replant it and cultivate it, you see. And this is what researcher Victor Hahn wrote in his book on plants in the ancient world. He said, it's very remarkable that the papyrus is now quite extinct in Egypt. And it is remarkable, what is, what, but what is even more remarkable is that a statement by Isaiah could say that the, the papyrus reeds would be driven away and be no more. And so it is true today. Let me just share with you one or two other amazing prophecies concerning ancient Egypt. When the Hebrew prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel lived, Egypt was so ancient that she boasted a longer line of kings than any other nation on earth. To Ezekiel, the settling of Egypt was as ancient as the beginning of the Christian religion is to us. To the prophets of his day, in 600 BC, Egypt was the granary of the world. It was eminent in science. It was a leader of civilization, luxury and so forth. And uh, a great amount of knowledge came from ancient Egypt. She had the unity and the repose and the grandeur and the majesty of conscious power and of great age. Her future looked bright and prosperous. Nevertheless, at a time when all other men would have predicted just unending prosperity for, for Egypt, Ezekiel wrote down the words of his God. He said, I'll sell the land into the hand of the wicked. I'll make the land waste and all that is therein by the hand of strangers. I, the Lord, have spoken it. And then he made this impressive statement. There shall be no more a prince of the land of Egypt. Now, that was by Ezekiel uh, in the 6th century BC. And if you've got no Egyptian princes, then you don't have any what? Egyptian kings or pharaohs. And um, while Egypt had had the longest line of kings of any nation, yet for the last 2,350 years... Every king that has sat on the throne of Egypt has been a foreigner, every last one, for over two millennia. In fact, it says here, George Rawlinson, in his book, The History of Ancient Egypt, he said, Thus perished the last of the long line of pharaohs, which, commencing with many, had ruled Egypt as a great independent monarchy for not less than 20 centuries. Now, the Egyptians came back in dynasties um, 28 to 30 and only lasted about 40 years. And the last Egyptian king was Nectodemo II of dynasty 30. And then came the Persian dynasties, you see. Uh, dynasty 31 was the Persian dynasty. Then came the Greek period, beginning with Alexander uh, the Great. From the Persian kings, 343 BC, to the last king of Egypt, which was King Farouk, he was deposed in 1952. But every single ruler of Egypt has been a foreigner from that Persian period. There shall be no more a prince of the land of Egypt. And you don't even have to be a believer to accept that because a fact is a fact. That's just what happened. goes on to say, They shall be a lowly kingdom and it shall be the lowliness of kingdoms. It will never again exalt itself above the nations. For I will diminish them so that they will not rule over the nations anymore. And that's exactly true what happened. First came the Babylonians and the Persians, the Romans, the Muslims, the British, the Arabs. Each foreign invasion that came, Egypt's power and greatness just diminished and went down a bit more and declined until finally it became poverty stricken and reduced to a lowly kingdom. In fact, even today... 
um, it's a lowly kingdom. Do you know, nearly 50% of Egypt's 90 million people live in pov poverty, with about 26% in extreme poverty. 31% of children under five are stunted due to malnutrition. 50% of people in Egypt live on the US $2 a day or less. Um, but they're delightful people. They're wonderful people. They love tourists coming. It's a great industry for them. They make money from it. Um, here's some ladies using their head. And um, you walk down the streets. There's the local uh, bakery. But I don't think I want to buy that piece. Or the piece you know, where we're standing on. Here's the local butcher, local butcher delivering some meat. Got to be careful what you eat, you know. I went through the markets and there were you know, things of meat just hanging outside like that and uh, an Egyptian guy there and every now and again he would give it a whack with a stick and all these black things would fly off. <laughs> Flies, yeah. Donkeys, by the way, are the four-wheel drives of Egypt. They carry or tow anything. Um, look at this great big water pump on the back of that donkey there and so on. Kids play on, the donkeys get a little bit of rest but not much. The prophet said, the pride of her power shall come down and I'll make the land of Egypt desolate and the country shall be destitute of that whereof it was once full. And the sun may have set on Egypt's past glory, but let me tell you, the glory of that old book of books still shines in brilliance in our modern age. The amazing predictions of biblical prophets have stood the test of time. Their words have come true in every detail. The evidence of archaeology for the past 150 years, right across the Bible lands of the Middle East, has demonstrated time and time again that the history and even the predictions of the old book of books are indeed trustworthy and reliable. Dr Nelson Gluick was an American born of German Jewish parents. He became an expert archaeologist and an expert on ancient pottery and dating time periods based on the pottery discovered. He identified over one and a half thousand biblical or, or sites of excavation during his, his career. Listen to what he said in his book, uh, Rivers in the Desert. He said, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. That is a massive statement for an archaeologist to say. No archaeology, archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. He went on to say scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible. And I'm going to share a few of them before the weekend is out. Now, people sometimes ask me, Mark, what do you think is the greatest contribution of biblical archaeology to our world? Well, I believe there are two major contributions. Number one, archaeology helps historians to restore history, ancient history. It's helped us to understand and reconstruct the past. But secondly, archaeology has in turn, not hasn't set out to do this, but it has helped to restore the credibility of biblical history and even prophecy. And for over 30 years now, this old book, the Bible, has captivate, captivated my attention. Its history continues to be verified by archaeological excavation. I just can't keep up with it. And I find it to be an absolutely amazing book and its ancient mysteries simply wonderfully simple and simply wonderful. So I trust that you will not miss a single session as we finish off and if we, you know, the next two days we're going to have another four sessions and let me just tell you that tomorrow morning we're going to Petra and this is one of the great sites of the ancient world. Um, Petra itself has nothing precisely biblical other than prior to the Nabataean civilization who built Petra, it was part of the Edomite civilization. And it's the ancient Edomites that fascinate me because this is a biblical kingdom. They were the brother nation to, um, it was Jacob and Esau. Edomites came from Esau and Israel came from Jacob, Jacob. And you'll be thrilled as we share a little bit about the Edomites and what they've discovered uh, just recently 
um, over there in Jordan and southern Israel. So we'll look at that tomorrow morning. And then after lunch in the afternoon, we're going to take up this subject of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, this, this is probably one of the greatest um, discoveries of all time, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we're going to find out what those scrolls have to do with one of the greatest kings of antiquity, a Persian king by the name of Cyrus the Great. That'll be a thrilling program um, tomorrow afternoon. And then on Sunday, we're going to have a look at Alexander the Great and the power of biblical prophecy. We'll join Alexander the Great in his famous siege of the Phoenician seaport city of Tyre and see how that event fulfilled an incredible biblical prediction. And then our final session on Sunday afternoon is simply the amazing discoveries of biblical archaeology. Um, I advertise this as the top 10 discoveries of biblical archaeology, but I'm not going to have time to do the top 10, so I'm going to give you the top 7 discoveries of biblical archaeology, and um, that's a thrilling... I, I think the story of these discoveries is absolutely thrilling and inspirational. And then when we conclude, we're treated to a dinner. Is that right? We will enjoy a nice um, digging up the past uh, finale dinner. So thank you for uh, being a good audience. And so from the people of Egypt and from me, good night and I'll see you tomorrow morning. God bless you.